I have with me Greg Caruso, who's a doctor of philosophy um, and also the author of Just Desserts, a book that I have worked very hard to get a copy of, um, but is available for, um, I think, South Africans on Amazon if you do want to get a copy. But the reason I think this debate is so important is obviously it has implications for public policy. Um, of course, I know that for philosophers, the intention is not always to have a debate that initially has an impact for public, for, for public policy, but this one does in particular. Um, and I think for liberals, um, especially, where so much of what we value is grounded or underpinned by the idea of free will and the free agent, I think it's important to explore what this debate um, you know, what the implications are for liberals and liberal democracy. So maybe, Greg, just to start off with the book and how it, um, it, 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 it came to be. I know there's a bit of an interesting, I know you, in, in the book, um, we hear that you and Dan met at a bar and it kind of progressed from there. Yeah, so um, I helped co-organize a conference in the Middle East in um, Beirut, Lebanon on moral psychology. I think it was the first conference on moral psychology in the Middle East. Um, and Dan Dennett was one of the speakers that we invited. And um, after an evening of talks and uh, various presentations, we started a conversation on this rooftop bar in, in uh, Beirut and started debating our respective views on free will. Um, and when we got back to the States, we started sending each other emails and a conversation kind of ensued. And at one point I suggested, well, why don't we write this up um, as a kind of debate or dialogue or conversation? And, and so that's what we did. And the, the first um, volley essentially was uh, published as a paper in Aeon Magazine. Um, and it seemed to spark a lot of interest. People really were interested in the conversation. It kind of got into areas of the debate that are not always typically addressed and right. um, looked at things from, from a kind of slightly different perspective than, than usual. Um, and then we were approached eventually from a publisher who said, you know, you want to turn this into a book. And since we both sort of respect each other's uh, philosophical views and, and each other, we thought it'd be a great project. And uh, um, and that's what it ended up, it ended up as a sort of um, book length exchange written like a conversation or dialogue um, where we debate our respective views on free will, moral responsibility, criminal punishment, um, and various other aspects like how this impacts the law and morality. Right. But the, the debate itself on, on around free will is not new. Would you say that there is a renewed interest or is there mounting interest in the in, in the debate where where would you say it's at now yeah it's an interesting thing because um it seems like it's probably the most written about philosophical issue um uh that philosophers have been grappling with for centuries i i think second to god's existence is probably more ink has been spilled on the free will problem than any other topic um mm -hmm. But it's waned and it's and it's you know uh, its interests have come and gone over time. But I think there's a real um, renewed interest in the issue of free will, and part of it I think has to do with um, there's been some really interesting philosophical work that have shifted the the debate to to uh, sort of new issues. And then the other aspect, and that's largely how I address it in my work, is I problematize the issue of free will. Yeah. It's not a purely abstract metaphysical question about agents and whether or not they have this abstract thing called free will. I've tried to tie it to real life um, practices. Yeah. And so that I, I've tried to problematize it in a way that it's, it's directly related to our interpersonal relationships, our public policy, or especially our issues and, and policies on criminal justice. Um, and that is... I think sort of sparked a renewed interest in the problem that we now see that it can, it, it has tentacles that affect almost every aspect of our lives. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly think that we'd see free will schism in particular um, becoming something that's more broadly discussed in the mainstream, especially because of how sensitive it is to the idea that there are systemic causes to social ills. And of course, if you just look at the political narrative today globally, that's very much kind of the focus is how can we focus our public policies um, more on the systemic causes of the, of the problems and challenges that confront us. Um, and possibly free will skepticism answers that um, more explicitly than, than anything else so far. I mean, I would think so. Um, 
it, it, I think that there is a sort of slowly growing momentum for the view. There was a recent article in The Guardian that talked about a rise in philosophers and scientists that have this view. It hasn't quite trickled down into the, the public psyche. And I think there's, there's good reason for that. I think the belief in free will is pretty strong. People have a sort of intuitive sense of it. It plays a really big cultural and social role in our thinking about things. And I think it's also tied into other sort of aspects and, and attitudes and judgments we have about people, their individual responsibility. Um, and there's been work in, in, in uh, psychology that even shows that sort of beliefs in free will are linked up with all these other things like um, one's attitudes about politics, one's views on a just world. Um, and so if you, you know, it's hard to sort of attack a kind of a belief that people hold really central to, to their worldview and to their web of beliefs, their attitudes. Um, so it's a hard belief mm -hmm. to question, to get people to question. But I think once you break into the arguments and dissect them and sort of lay out, at least my view, what the arguments against it are, people begin to see it as sort of intuitive. Um, and so I think, I think it has the potential to, to really drastically affect people's attitudes about um, everything from our, our economic policies to our criminal justice policies. Yeah, and that leads us nicely then to, well, a little bit of a definitional discussion. What are we talking about? Um, at least to actually make it a bit simpler, what are you talking about um, in, in the book when you talk about yeah. free will and how do you define free will sketches them? Great, so I define free will as the control and action that's required for a particular type of moral responsibility. So I want the issue of free will to be tied to the issue of moral responsibility. But the kind of responsibility I have in mind is the kind that would make agents truly deserving of praise and blame and punishment and a reward. So if agents have the kind of free will that I'm debating, then they would be legitimate targets for blame, resentment, retributive punishment, if we lack the kind of free will that I'm debating, then agents wouldn't be morally responsible in what I call the basic dessert sense. Yeah. That is the sense that would make us truly deserving of praise and blame, punishment and reward in a sort of simply backward looking sense. That is because the agent was free um, and they engaged in some wrongdoing, they simply deserve to be punished regardless of whether or not it would have any forward looking benefit. So the yeah. title of the book, Just Desserts, I've realized some people understand that reference and some people, I guess it's not as familiar as I thought. It's not desserts, like what you eat after dinner and it's not <laughs> deserts. Um, the idea of just desserts is punishment that's deserved. Yes. That is, if an agent has the kind of free will that's under dispute, um, then they deserve certain types of treatment, certain types of judgments, certain types of legal punishment. Yeah. If we don't, it has this drastic sort of systemic effect on our interpersonal relationships, our interpersonal attitudes, our judgments about blame and praise, and our policies about punishment and reward. Yeah, um, I think we'll come as we as well as probably as you unpack, it'll become clear that it doesn't jettison the idea of control entirely, but it's a no. particular kind of control that is that is um, you know by virtue of which one can be held you know, morally responsible in the sense that you describe of saying that they deserve either blame or praise. So I think that's part of the reason why I think it does retain a great deal that is still that we value in terms of holding people responsible. But yeah, I want to make that clear. So like, I'm a free will skeptic. So as a free will skeptic, I maintain that who we are, what we do is ultimately the result of factors beyond our control. And because of this, we're never morally responsible in this basic dessert sense, the sense where mm -hmm. agents deserve in some basic way to be praised or blamed, punished and rewarded. Um, but that doesn't mean I reject other notions of responsibility or other notions of agency. Um, so for example, agents are still causally responsible. That is, you are causally responsible for a particular outcome, just like Hurricane Katrina was causally responsible for the damage done to New Orleans. Um, you but you could also be responsible Right, without blame. But you could also be um, responsible in what we call the attributability sense. I could attribute to you various characteristics or attributes um, having to do with your work ethic or um, certain types of character traits that you might possess or predispositions. Those would be attributable to the agent, even if the agent isn't responsible for self-making them. That is making them um, in a way that they deserve um, to be judged or praised or blamed for having become the kind of person they are. 
Right. Um, and there are other senses of responsibility that, that I think remain totally in place. So I wanna make it clear, at least on my view, I'm what I call an optimistic skeptic. I'm optimistic yeah. about the practical implications of giving up the belief in free will and giving up the belief in this basic dessert kind of notion of moral responsibility. So I think we could still have meaning in life. We could still sustain uh, meaningful interpersonal relationships. Um, I think you know um, we could we could still deal successfully with criminal behavior, even though we might have to give up certain types of retributive uh, um, approaches or or certain severe forms of punishment like the death penalty. We could still retain other aspects and other approaches. So my overall sort of position is we could retain much of what we care about, even if we give up this sort of notion that agents are are responsible in this fun you know, morally responsible in this fundamental basic sense. So let's build up then kind of the, the argument for free will skepticism and maybe starting yeah. with the idea of determinism, which I know is not the argument in its entirety for free will skepticism, but it's, it's, it's a big part of it, I would say. Um, and for those not kind of, um, you know, familiar with it, how does the idea of determinism lead us to free will skepticism? Yeah, great question. So um, you know, first let me define determinism. Determinism is a sort of thesis that um, every event or action, including human actions, are the inevitable result of um, the laws of nature and antecedent events. So like, you know, uh, what's come, these antecedent meaning prior events that have led up to a specific moment. And, or you want to put it differently, uh, determinism is the thesis that um, facts about the remote past in conjunction with the laws of nature entail is only one fixed future. And this view comes from science, essentially, that from the traditional sort of Newtonian view of science, the world is deterministic. Um, um, so the laws of nature dictate the behavior of all physical things. And if we're just physical things in the physical universe, then we are part of this you know, deterministic system. So you'd go as far as saying that free will is in fact anti-scientific. Well, so let me get, so, it, so some people, some people have argued that if determinism is true, then we lack free will, because if determinism is true, then agents would lack the ability to have done otherwise, um, or they would not be the ultimate source of their actions, the source would drain back to these antecedent events. There is a view called compatibilism, which tries to say that determinism and free will can be reconciled. It sounds like the you know can be made compatible. That's that's what the view says, um, but there's a lot of controversy about that. And in fact, in the book, Dan Dennett is a compatibilist, and I'm a what's called incompatibilist. Yes, but I think at least for beginners, surely an easy way to kind of maybe sidestep the complexities of that compatibilist discussion is to yeah. say, well, at least for our purposes, if you want if we want to understand what free will skepticism is and what its consequences are for public policy, it's not actually it doesn't rest on determinism alone. So even if the arguments for determinism aren't convincing, oh, there's yeah. other reasons to, to you know for this for this idea. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, I'm officially um, agnostic about the truth of determinism. Um, so I think that whether determinism is true or not, we lack free will. Um, partly because I don't think indeterminism would help. Um, introducing some randomness isn't going to help. But the other big argument is, that you're alluding to is my argument from Locke. Um, so just you know, forget all the complexities of determinism. Just think about um, what we commonly refer to as luck. And I distinguish, let's just make it easy, two types of luck. They're, in the literature, there's more, but um, there's what I call present luck, luck around the time of action. And there's what's called constitutive luck, the luck that makes you the kind of person you are. So think of like the lottery of life. The lottery of life isn't always fair. We have no ultimate control, whether we're born in a particular country, whether we're born into uh, poverty or wealth. We don't have no ultimate control. It's a matter of luck, whether I'm born white or black, male or female, uh, whether I'm born with certain learning disabilities or not. That's all a matter of luck, i.e. it's um, you know good or bad luck. It's outside of my control. And once you start realizing that how much of one's life is constituted and one's personality and character and uh, psychological makeup is constituted by those factors of love, by the society in which we're born, the families in which we're raised, the social and economic systems that we um, grow up in, 
So that's constitutive luck. And then present luck is luck around the time of action. That could be the luck of what thoughts come to you at a particular moment, the luck of um, what reasons weigh most heavily on your deliberation when you're trying to make a choice, the luck of the color of the walls um, could affect your deliberation and your mood in a way that you're unaware of, the luck of, um, of um, what just led up prior to, to the event. So like, we all have this experience where maybe we had an argument with our uh, significant other in the morning. And throughout the day, you realize it's affecting your interactions with your secretary and other people. Um, that would be a kind of luck because those earlier events shouldn't be you know, affecting your choices or we often think they're not, but they're playing this background role. I would say that our actions are ultimately the result of luck, that luck swallows all. The combination of present luck and constitutive luck um, ultimately um, um, determine what we do. And, and that I think luck undermines free will again in the sense that who we are and what we do is ultimately a result of factors beyond our control. We don't control fact, you know, matters of determinism. We don't control indeterminate events, but we also don't control matters of luck. And so whether you're looking at it from a deterministic perspective, indeterministic perspective, or simply from the perspective of luck, it seems like when you reflect very carefully who we are, what we do is the result of um, a myriad of causes, a myriad of factors that we really don't control. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, there's some who'd want to push back against that, that idea a little bit to say, well, of course, there's luck, but there are certain ways in which we can respond to luck. So if you talk about those constitutive factors, there are certain endowments or characteristics of birth that we're naturally born with that perhaps we have very little control over initially. But once we are aware of our particular deficiencies, we have the ability or capacity throughout life to, you know, go to school, um, we, we read books, we are, um, you know, we, we, we learn or we develop the ability to respond to these you know, external factors that are acting upon us and to act on them in turn. Yeah. So I would say uh, essentially that the ability to respond to those factors of luck is itself a result of luck. That is um, the kind of ability you might have to um, work harder or to persevere is a matter of either your constitutive luck or present luck. That is, you either have these abilities because again, you've been shaped to have this predisposition to react to luck in this particular kind of way. Um, and that itself, that character trait of, within yourself, your ability to react or not react in a certain kind of way is already a byproduct of your psychological makeup, which I would argue is a result of luck. You know, if you think about how one reacts to, to these factors, I mean, some people just maybe say lack the cognitive capacity. Some people lack the opportunity. Um, you know, like you, you mentioned, you know, you might, you might drill down in your, your work at school, um, but there might be economic issues that affect that. Or you might have an encouraging teacher. You might have the luck of meeting somebody or meeting a friend who also values education, which spurs you to value education. But that, again, is a, is a result of a factor sort of beyond your control. Um, so who we are, you have the ability to shape matters of luck, but that ability itself, I think, is a result of luck. Right. And, and of course, could we not reach a position where they might still, or not might, there will still be um, either present luck or elements of constitutive luck that still act upon us now that, that were, you know, that were um, factors that we were born with, etc. But can we not have sufficient control over enough areas in order to be held morally responsible? So are you skeptical about the ability for even public policy to, in fact, enhance our agency? So we may very well say that people who lack the initial um, or throughout their childhood educational endowments that that would incapacitate you to some degree if you didn't have any education. We could say that if you didn't have a supportive environment, etc. But can we not identify enough, if you could say a ground zero of social and natural endowments that a human being needs in order to be able to be a human being who has the kind of control to which we can attribute uh, moral responsibility? Yeah, so I would say in the broad sense, no to the moral responsibility, if you understand it in the sense I'm understanding it. But let me make it clear, and this comes out in my debate with Dan Dennett, um, make it clear that I'm not denying um, that agents have various levels of control. 
I'm not denying that agents have different types of capacities. So for example, suffer, someone suffering from a met, uh, severe form of mental illness has a diminished sense of control versus someone who is uh, fully reasons responsive, i.e. responsive to reasons, can modify their actions in accordance with reasons. Um, and so I acknowledge there's degrees of control, there's different types of control. I acknowledge that there's different types of autonomy or self-determination that agents may have. What I would deny is that agents um, should be held morally responsible in the basic sense uh, for their actions, because ultimately whether or not they have, which type of level of control they have and how they develop their, their control or their lack of capacity of control is itself the result of factors beyond their control. So I don't think agents are responsible in the basic sense, but I don't wanna deny what the compatibilist points out about the differences between different types of agents. And in terms of public policy, I absolutely agree that one of the goals of public policy should be to enhance control, should be able to, to enhance the degree of autonomy that agents have, give them the tools and the opportunities necessary to, um, to, to develop the skills that would contribute and, and make up their well being. But that said, I don't necessarily think it helps in terms of public policy to still think individuals should be given their just desserts when they fail. Um, and so I think that ultimately the failure or success people, so in the, in the debate with uh, Dennett, um, I, I, you know, Dennett's really good with these kind of folksy analogies. And he says, look, I get it. The lottery of life is not always fair. We don't all have equal starting points. And he gives this analogy of a foot race. He says, okay, imagine we give someone a head start based on what month they were born in, a matter of luck. No one controls what month they're born in. Is it fundamentally unfair? And he says, well, it would be if it were a sprint, but life is more like a marathon and luck equals out in life. And I argue, well, BS to that really, because if you look at the, the empirical data, um, those initial inequalities actually compound themselves over time. And certain people are gonna over, uh, face different types of hurdles, more difficult hurdles than others. Poverty, low socioeconomic status, educational inequity, um, um, mental illness or mental health in general. Um, those kinds of initial um, factors of luck have drastic effects over the lives of individuals and the lives of the control and, and ability to regulate themselves and guide their own actions in accordance with various types of moral reasoning. Um, but I don't think it's helpful to, to retain the notion of free will and basic desert here, because I think once we abandon the belief in free will and abandon the notion of just desserts, which I actually see as kind of a repressive kind of notion, once we abandon those notions, we can look more deeply into the causes and more deeply into the systems that shape individuals. Once you realize that individuals are more of a byproduct of their circumstances, um, then we could help to give them the tools necessary to level that playing field and encourage individuals and adopt policies that, that sort of address these inequalities, uh, that address these systemic causes of criminality, educational inequity, um, poverty. Yeah, but to be clear, the goal of those public policies of leveling the field is to, well, I suppose for various reasons, to improve that person's, you know, quality of life, et cetera, their ability to engage in a society with the kind of rules that we have, but never is the objective to get them to a point of agency where we can ever hold them morally responsible. That would not be, that's not possible. Um, it's not possible in this basic sense for me, because yes, I don't think any of us have it, but um, that doesn't mean we let criminals run free. That doesn't mean there won't be consequences for various types of actions. Um, that doesn't mean we have to give up notions of morality, of right and wrong. So like, we could still say that um, what Hitler did was morally wrong, even if um, we give up the notion of free will, because judgments of good and bad and right and wrong, on my view, could be retained independent of, of, of thinking that individuals are self-made or that individuals are responsible in any basic sense. Yeah. Um, we could still adopt certain types of uh, moral judgments. We could still adopt certain conceptions of justice, I would argue. And in fact, I actually think the system of justice that I adopt is, is what I call a capabilities approach 
to social justice. I think we'll we'll get to that, but I want to explore just one. I don't think it's it's teased out ever um, comprehensively in the book, but there is a point in the book where you talk about um, I think narrow versus wide um, oh, yeah. emotional responses. And in yeah. that moment, it seemed to me a bit as though you were creating room for, for free will, because if there's, I mean, just to explain it a little bit in terms of how I understood it, was you were saying that, of course, in terms of narrow emotional responses, in the moment, if something happens, you might not be able to have the um, quick, rational, whatever else reflexes to behave differently. But over time, and as we learn, and as we respond to new information, there is the possibility to behave differently. That possibility to behave differently, surely, is precisely why those who hold on to the idea of free will would, would say, well, aha, well, that's, a, that's precisely the evolutionary or the differences in growing up or maturity from birth to becoming an adult that they point to. It's the level of control to be able to reason and then respond to that. That's precise, It's precisely that ability um, that you're suggesting in the, in the long term we would have that um, you know, that gives us the, the sufficient threshold for um, of control to be held blameworthy or praiseworthy. Yeah, I, well, I would I would disagree. And part of the reason is, is that, you know, when I give arguments or we give reasons, um, in this case, philosophical uh, arguments, maybe against free will, I think reasons are causes. So if if you could give um, various types of reasons that move people's beliefs, a determinist or a free will skeptic doesn't have to um, deny that people change their minds or that reasons could affect their thinking and change their beliefs. It doesn't deny that reasons can affect one's attitudes toward public policy. Um, what I would say in terms of that distinction is so the reactive um, emotions are the sort of the ones you have in the moment, in the experience. And these are sort of hardwired, evolutionarily speaking. They've, they've probably served a purpose um, in our survival in the past. So you might feel anger when someone wrongs you. Um, we might have a retributive impulse, i.e. a strike back emotion when, when, some, when it, we confront some injustice. And I acknowledge that we might not be able to completely eradicate those. Um, but what I can um, do as a philosopher, as, I, uh, as someone who thinks arguments can move us, is I can um, begin to give reasons that alter what I call my broad reactive or emotional attitudes, which is that when I reflect upon the, the case, I realize that, well, that attitude was um, suboptimal or unjustified. That emotional reaction, although it was real and I had it, I shouldn't give it any justificatory force. I, I shouldn't use that anger or that retributive impulse to guide my public policies. Um, or adopt, you know, retributive attitudes or approaches to punishment. Simply because I have that emotional reaction in an interpersonal relationship doesn't mean it has this kind of justification. And I think we can gain that kind of control in that we could observe our own emotional states and judge whether they're rational or not, whether we should give them some kind of power in justifying our attitudes and beliefs or not. But I don't think that's free will. Again, because I think there's always these antecedent causes. There's always factors of luck. There's always um, reasons that are um, explain exactly why we come to have that reaction and exactly why we you know, reason in that particular way. Um, and so again, I, I, I don't wanna blame um, individuals who, la who uh, lack that kind of control or ability. I don't wanna praise agents that do. Um, of course, I think it's useful to adopt approaches that try to shift one's beliefs, but that's consistent with free will skepticism. Yes. I mean, I think this is then maybe a good uh, point to go back then to, I think, what you're already getting into about the idea that, well, there are still consequences. Um, you know, there are still consequences in a society that would hypothetically be founded on the idea of free will skepticism. Um, I'd just like to talk about, maybe you want to start first by talking about what you refer to in your book as the public health quarantine model, what that would look like, because I think the practical example would help to illustrate how there might indeed still be consequences for, um, for wrongdoers, if I can put it that way. Yeah, right. So, so the public health quarantine model is kind of my alternative to retributive punishment. And retributive punishment is just the idea that wrongdoers deserve um, to be punished for their wrongdoing simply because they had done wrong, they deserve some kind of retribution payback. And it's purely you know, grounded in the notion of just desserts. 
but it requires uh, this belief in free will and more responsibility that I reject. So what do I offer as an alternative? And what I suggest is um, we can adopt this approach that builds off of work that Dirk Kirboom and other philosophers have done. And it starts with this quarantine analogy. So the first part says something like, well, imagine I come to South Africa to, to, to meet you in person. And um, somehow I contract Ebola. And at the airport, I test positive. Well, I think we'd all agree that um, the state would be justified in quarantining me, limiting my liberty, holding me. Um, but we could say that that justification doesn't appeal in any way to free will or the idea that we have to give this individual their just desserts or that they're morally responsible for having contracted Ebola. Um, we could justify quarantining the individual simply on the, the, the right of self-defense and prevention of harm to others, i.e. Now we have all this familiarity with the public health uh, model because we've now suffered the COVID crisis. And, 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 and so the idea would be that, look, the right of self-defense and uh, uh, public safety, public health can justify limits on liberty. So what would we could do for seriously dangerous criminals? Uh, people who are killers, people who are child molesters, people who um, are repeat violent offenders is that we could justify an incapacitation account, i.e. incapacitating them, limiting their liberty, restricting their liberty, on the grounds of the right of self-defense and prevention of harm to others that's analogous to the justification we give for quarantine. But the idea in my model would be that um, not only is this non-retributive, it's also non-punitive in that we don't necessarily punish the Ebola patient. Um, when we limit their liberty. Because punishment usually requires more than just a restriction on liberty. Punishment usually entails an intentional harm. I'm intentionally seeking to harm the wrongdoer. Um, it also it, it involves usually a condemnatory component. We condemn the individual, we condemn their wrongdoing. Um, we don't do that when we, when we uh, quarantine the Ebola patient. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same thing could be done in the criminal justice context, i.e., um, what we, what the goal of the criminal justice system should be on my model is to rehabilitate and reintegrate individ individuals, not to punish them yeah. um, in, the, in, the sen in the traditional sense of punishment. Yeah. And part of my reason is because of the philosophical views I have about free will, but part of it is also purely, purely based on effectiveness. Retributivism is very ineffective. It's often very inhumane. I think it's unjustified. But even if you didn't share my views about free will, um, you might still think that, look, the policies we currently adopt toward criminal behavior, um, they're simply not working, at least in the United States. Um, we have one of the highest rates of incarceration in, in, the, in the world. Um, for every 100,000 people, we imprison 700 people. Yeah, now, I think what might be unsatisfactory for, for some, and, and, and certainly I think um, um, Janet raises a similar argument in the book, if not the exact same one, I might be paraphrasing his example a bit, but of the, a society where perhaps you've advanced technologically enough to maybe let's say have some kind of pull that one can take and you guarantee that if somebody takes the, this pull, they'd be rewired as to no longer have any kind of violent impulses. So you can be certain that the, the reason for quarantining them or incarcerating them in terms of as a self-defense mechanism or, or for the reasons of public safety is no longer there because once they take the pull, they'll no longer be a threat to society. But yet a lot of people would feel yeah. that, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem to be sufficient. So, and also there's still incentive for others to go around murdering because the only consequence is they'll be given this pull that will remove all of their violent impulses. Yeah, so, so th that's a really good objection. And, and so I, I think I, at certain a point, have to just bite the bullet because yes, my justification is that once the individual poses no forward-looking threat, um, we lose the ability of the justification for, for incapacitating them. Just like in the quarantine case, that the minute you, re, um, you treat the Ebola patient and they're no longer, uh, uh, you know, have this communicable disease, we no longer have any justification for continuing the quarantine. Them. In the case of this imaginary pill, I guess I would say a few things. I mean, one would be, um, uh, well, you know, I, I don't think 
you know, we're anywhere near this kind of reality. Secondly, I would also suggest that um, there might be ethical reasons independent of my model for, for thinking this would be a bad public policy to administer this kind of pill. And in terms of the fact that it would probably change one's personality, which trains one's psychological makeup. We have to worry about issues of, of, uh, of autonomy and, and the rights of individuals. So there might be all kinds of reasons. But yes, if we were, if there were some magic way to just wave a wand and individuals were no longer a threat to, to public safety, then I do think um, we have to rethink our retributive attitudes. I know people have this really strong re yeah. retributive desire to say, but look, they still deserve some form of, of punishment. Um, but what I would suggest is, you know, maybe we, we should rethink that. And let me just suggest one thing that you might be more familiar with. When you think of something like restorative justice or in South Africa, reconciliation, when you come to these really crucial moments in history where you have to address prior atrocities, what often has been shown to work most effectively is not to double down on retributivism, not to go back and try to um, evoke um, justice for, on all the wrongdoers, but to um, in part figure out ways that would effectively move us forward. Um, and so I would just think that in many cases, it's simply counterproductive to try to, um, to retain this kind of desire to give individuals their just desserts. Um, and so I would just bite the bullet in this hypothetical case. I would say that we're far from any reality where that would, where that would really play out in any, any real way. So that's um, where I want to perhaps question a bit is that, okay, so leaving aside the pull example, let's use some, because I think the pull example is almost used as a, as a hypothetical, but as a proxy for real yeah. world examples that might have similar uh, features. So for example, I mean, I just made this up now, so let's hope this analogy holds, but yeah. let's take an example of a disabled accountant, okay, yeah. who has embezzled funds where he was, you know, working. Now, one, um, you know, possibly to say, well, he can no longer do so if you remove him from that workplace. So an alternative to incarceration could be, well, he loses the license to operate in any kind of financial services field. So you've got rid of any ability for him in future to replicate that same wrong. Um, and at the same time, though, there's nothing, you know, in terms of, um, you know, but also there's, there aren't any other means available. So you can't say he can maybe do community service because let's imagine he's disabled in a way that doesn't allow him to um, give back to society or deal in any other way with the consequence of what he's done. I think a lot of people would feel you can't just be, so there'd be no consequence for a person like that because, well, the consequence, of course, they no longer get to practice, but you say a consequence like that is sufficient. Well, I would say that, look, there are other aspects um, and the law allows for these in other contexts. So we have criminal law, but we also have tort law and we have um, laws that can address like say um, restitution, right? Yeah. So th those kinds of um, arguments for restitution could be given in ways that don't really uh, appeal to basic desert or more responsibility. Well, I should have maybe said a disabled broke accountant. Okay, well, so the more we build the door, right, yeah. The possibility of restitution. Right, so, I mean, we could build the case so that uh, there's no means of restitution, there's no forward-looking threat, um, yeah. but there's no ability to, you know, to work to service the people they've wronged. Um, and the more we add, yeah, I mean, the question I would ask the person who wants to retain, well, what would you do? So the idea is, I guess, that this person still gets in prison, still gets um, severely punished, despite the fact they're in poor health, despite the fact they're not a threat to society, despite the fact that they can't contribute to their victims. Um, we just want to punish them. And I would just question that desire where it's rooted. I think it's rooted still in the belief that people are fundamentally um, uh you know, need to be given their just desserts. But I would question whether that, that reaction is justified. Um, and I would, you know, I would ask also what good it does. If all the, all the benefits can be achieved without um, that kind of um, purely backward looking retributive reaction, um, mm -hmm. what additional good is it serving society?
Well, I think there's also this idea of proportionality. And by proportionality, I'm talking about of the suffering of the victim. So, you know, if you've lost your life savings, the, what's happened to the victim is that they're no longer able to, to survive. They've lost, you know, whatever else they've lost and their life will never be the same. The only thing this other person loses is, well, let's say they're no longer allowed to work in a, in a, in a role that where they deal or handle other people's money. But that doesn't seem to put them or give them a proportional punishment that is proportional to the wrong that they committed. Right, and that's exactly what the retributive, I say my view still maintains a proportionality principle but a different type that the incapacitation or the, uh, lim the liberty limiting uh, kind of response that the state would have would have to be proportionate to the threat the individual poses. So I still think it's proportional but a different type of proportionality. I would say like, you know, in the Bernie Madoff case, which was a guy in, in, in America who had his Ponzi scheme who defrauded all of these people out of millions of dollars. Um, not only you actually lose his license and not only in, you know, in his case, um, um, you know, other liber liberties might be limited given any forward looking threat he might pose. Um, I think restitution in his case would be justified because he has the means to restore what was taken from the victims, right? In the case where the person lacks any funding to do that, um, I would say that, you know, our desire for proportionality in this case is just getting the best of us. And we're holding uh, onto notions that I think are both unjustified, often lead to inhumane treatments. I mean, because if, well, one case that's more realistic in my view is we have a population in the United States in prison that is aging out. So the proportional punishment that they were handed down by the court was like, look, you get 20 years or you get 50 years. Um, and that's proportional to whatever crime you committed. But we know from empirical data that after a certain age, the chances of recidivism drastically begin to reduce until it's a point where it actually reaches zero. So when you get you know, prisoners who are 50 or 60 years old, um, in many cases, they, 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 they present no threat to public safety if they were to be released. And yet on this proportionality principle, on this retributive approach, they are still held. Yeah. in the United States. And we have one of the largest populations in the world that's serving what are called virtual life sentences. That is the sentences that they've been given that was proportional to their crime um, means effectively that they're gonna die in prison because the number of years they were given is longer than the natural life they're gonna have. Mm -hmm. um, I would just see these policies as overall inhumane and I would rather bite the bullet on this imaginary pill case than to adopt principles that lead to mass incarceration, that lead to such inhumane conditions in our prison systems. So we have only 4.5% of the world's population in the United States, relatively small sliver, yet we house 25% of the world's prisoners. That's the highest rate of incarceration known to civilization. We have more people in the criminal justice system than any other nation. One out of every 31 Americans is somewhere within the criminal justice system, i.e. parole, probation, prison, federal jail. Um, that's too huge a proportion of the population to criminalize, to yeah. monitor and to try to be given their just desserts. Yeah, and let's look at another aspect of this, which is um, deterrence. Um, you know, to what extent um, then there's scope for deterrence in this kind of system. And I know in the book, you you express, you know, hesitation or you, well, maybe hesitation is too soft a word. You, you disagree with taking um, the view um, of, you know, having these consequentialist reasons for, um, Yeah this kind of um, you know criminal justice system but I would say and, and I think the reason you use is to say that well you don't find it right to ground essentially using people as a means to an end and it's in inappropriate to use people in this way um, and essentially the only reasons for deterrence would be well you're using somebody in, in order to deter others and this doesn't seem or doesn't sit right with you but I, I thought one aspect that was perhaps um, ignored is that, well, the deterrence is not necessarily only for the deterrence of others. It's quite possible that you're not being used as a means to an end, but that you yeah. are the end in the sense that it could be used to deter you. That's the reason why we have maybe some more punitive um, sentences is you're the person that it's meant to deter. So um, there'd be um, less recidivism as we, as we talked about. Um, yeah. So we can look at deterrence in terms of not deterring others, but deterring the very same criminal from doing it again. Yeah, there's two types of deterrence. So the distinction you made is often captured in what's called specific and general deterrence. One, five, one type of deterrence is 
you uh, punish an individual so as to deter others from committing similar crimes. The other type is to, be, to alter the moral fiber or makeup of the individual and, and <clears throat> hopefully deter them. And we see that quite often in parenting, right? So my daughter does some, some act in school that I disapprove of or does something wrong or breaks a rule and you punish her so um, as to alter her future choices, right? You're weighing her moral scales. You're trying to develop her as a moral agent so that she thinks about her actions in the future and doesn't do that. I would say, um, you know, a couple of things. I mean, I think you captured nicely my reasons for resisting this. It's not because of my free will skepticism. It's because I have these other moral concerns that um, when it comes to, de to the use of de uh, deterrence when it's used to deter others, I think that it runs into this kind of manipulation problem where we manipulate or use individuals. So in the United States, three strikes are outlaws were primarily used for basic, for purposes of deterrence. So the idea was people who committed three felonies were given life in prison. And the argument was that this would effectively deter would be felons. But what it's actually resulted in is people serving life sentences for really low level crimes, for nonviolent crimes, um, for, crime, for kinds of crimes that we really, I think intuitively think this is excessively harsh punishment. Um, and I think that that's just wrong. Um, and it would be unjustified on my model because the risk the individual poses doesn't warrant that. Um, yeah. The use of, of deterrence to alter the individual, I would say a couple things to this. One, I think I get a kind of free deterrence um, or deterrence on the cheap, which is like, if we're just transparent about our policies and we say that people who commit violent crimes um, could be incapacitated or will be incapacitated because they pose a threat to public safety. Um, that has the um, natural side effect of potentially deterring individuals. But I don't want the deterrence to be part of my justificatory uh, framework because I don't want us um, adopting program policies or reactions that go beyond what my model would allow. And I think deterrence too often allows that. I would also add one thing. The free will skeptic can also um, go back to the parenting case and the use of deterrence. The free will skeptic, on my view, um, can justify um, what I call accountability responsibility. Um, I'm sorry, not account, answerability responsibility, where mm -hmm. say when my, my daughter does something bad at school um, or when a wrongdoer, any wrongdoer does some, some wrong act, you could ask them, why did they make that choice? Um, to reflect about the nature of the act, to identify it as a wrong act or a bad act. I said you could retain that as a free will skeptic. And then to have them identify some flaw in themselves that maybe was the result of that bad, that wrong act. And then to agree to uh, work moving forward to work on that aspect of themselves, to reconcile it so they don't commit those acts in the future. And the justification on my model for these forward looking, um, moral exchanges, conversations, would be essentially um, three forward-looking um, features, future safety, future reconciliation, and future moral formation. Um, but none of those have to be grounded in backward-looking dessert. As a good parent, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, um, you know, engage my daughter in, in when she engages in wrongful acts. I'm gonna ask her why she made the choices she did. I'm gonna ask her to reflect upon that act. I'm gonna ask her what she could do differently in the future. And I think all of that is consistent with rejecting basic dessert because it's justification is not backward looking, it's forward looking and it's not grounded in dessert at all. In the criminal context though, I am worried about adopting policies that are purely based on deterrence because I do think that they can often exceed um, what individuals um, would, would on my model um, license some kind of limiting of liberty. Right. I mean, I'm also interested beyond prison um, reform or reform of the criminal justice system and um, the possibility that free will skepticism as an idea could influence other areas. So I think in the workplace, um, the idea, for example, of merit is also such a large part of in most um, liberal democracies. And, and I think actually merit or the idea of a meritocracy was also, I mean, a progressive idea. It was the idea that, well, you know, opportunities shouldn't be afforded to people, you know, just by birthright or um, other um, something else, but that we have the ability um, to exercise our talents, et cetera. We have the, the, the agency to improve yeah. ourselves. 
cycles. And on that basis, we can say to people that when they succeed, well, well done, you, you deserve it, you deserve where you are. And, and indeed, many people who have worked hard to where they are feel that they are self-made individuals. They've worked hard to be in the positions where they are at. And similarly, we tend to well, I think there's less of that, well, depending on where you where you sit, uh, you know, politically, but I think there can be, and often I would say those more on the center right and right to say, well, people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps, you know, to look down on those who haven't become so successful, because we view it in some way as some kind of internal individual failing that they have failed to do so. So it seems that there's big implications for, for this idea in, in, other, in other cases as well. Yeah, um, so I say that you, you're pointing out some of the good features of, of praise and reward and uh, meriting accomplishments, but I also want to note that there's often quite a dark side to, to that. And, and so I think that this notion of meritocracy plays a big role in our society and our thinking, in our economic policies, as well as our criminal justice policies. But I also think um, it could be, I think it's a myth, first of all. And I also think that it's potentially harmful. Um, so I'll give you, you know, a, a couple, uh, you know, quick examples. I mean, one, you know, is, is uh, just to quote, you know, um, someone who was also a free will skeptic. Einstein once said that, you know, um, he was a, a free will skeptic and he believed that his own accomplishments he didn't deserve praise for, <laughs> developing special relativity. But I think that you could still say that Einstein was a creative person, that he was a smart, you could attribute various uh, uh, aspects and traits and properties to Einstein without actually having to buy into the notion of a meritocracy or of a, of a, of a genius. And, and this plays, a, a, unfortunately, a role in our economic thinking. Um, so Obama, President Obama, when he was president, gave this speech in front of a group of successful business people. And he um, said this quote that really triggered something on the right. He said, well, you know, if you succeed in a business, you didn't build it yourself. Um, and this runs counter to this attitude you have um, that successful people are self-made, that they pick themselves from, up from the bootstraps, that it was purely a, a matter of personal uh, grit, you know, and they deserve all the rewards for their accomplishments. Um, and so the right, um, uh, the conservative party in the United States ran their presidential convention that year around the slogan, yes, we did. Yes, we did. We built it ourselves. And I think that that's a pernicious notion. That you built it yourself because it, it 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 ends up having the effect that we blame those in poverty for their own uh, circumstances because well they could have just picked themselves up from the bootstrap so they could have just worked harder or we could blame those in cases of educational inequity by saying it's just the the, the fault of the children or the parents themselves um and if you listen to the next sentence obama said i think it's just factually correct what he said is well if you succeeded in business you probably had a helpful uh an encouraging parent um, a helpful teacher along the way. Someone probably contributed to your success. You know, factors of luck play a big role. And what I wanna just quickly raise, cause it's important in psychology is that there's been evidence that the belief in free will has been shown to correlate with something called the belief in a just world. And the belief in a just world, I didn't make this up. This is a something psychologists study. And the belief in a just world is the belief that well, the world is just, good, thing happen, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. But the problem with the belief in a just world, which is tied obviously to meritocracy and individual responsibility, um, is that it ends up becoming a blame the victim approach. And the most obvious example of this is rape victims. So someone who is raped, that's a horrific thing. Um, and in a just world, such a horrific thing wouldn't happen to a good person, an innocent person. So unconsciously, people don't do, they do this consciously, but unconsciously to preserve the belief in a just world, you somehow make the victim deserving. Because in a just world, such a bad thing wouldn't happen to a good person. And so um, in, in, in actual cases in, in the courtroom, what happens is defense attorneys um, you know, blame the, the victim themselves. Well, they were dressed provocatively. They were walking where they shouldn't be walking or they were intoxicated or they brought it upon themselves. Um, and they do it because it works. And it works because juries want to preserve this belief in a just world, which is tied to the belief in free will, tied to meritocracy. But what it ultimately does is it blames someone who, you know, the world isn't just. This is simply a bad thing. And there's no good reason for why it happened. And there's no justice in it. Yeah. And so when you have this, when you have this desire to, to preserve these kind of intuitions, 
um, that are all wrapped up with this, you know, Kazasui bootstrapping, you know, self-made kind of concept we have of ourselves is you end up blaming those in poverty. You say that it's a matter of uh, laziness. You blame those who have been victimized of crimes. You blame those um, who suffer from other kinds of social injustices. And some sell, so to say, well, look, I made my way out of those circumstances and everyone else can as well. Well, you know, part of those few cases of success are largely the byproduct of, of small little interventions of luck. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if others have had the same opportunities, they may have made themselves their way out of there as well. But it also has this tendency to not look at the systemic causes, because if everything is just a matter of individual responsibility, it's like when you have a hammer, everything's a nail. When everything is a matter of individual responsibility, well, the right response to crime is punitive. The right res response to economic inequality is to just incentivize merit. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't really afford the opportunities that, that, uh, to those that are being held back by more larger systemic factors. Yes. And I have been playing devil's advocate a little bit because actually I do find the reasoning around free will skepticism and very compelling. But I suppose, I mean, you know, my issue is that I want to almost say some elements that I think people find important mostly for consequentialists or yeah. what we, you know talking about um, forward-looking reasons as opposed to retaining them for the reasons yeah. of blaming people or holding them uh, praiseworthy depending on the circumstances i think there are very good reasons to hold on to the idea of meritocracy but i think that we can underpin meritocracy with free will skepticism as opposed to yeah. currently where meritocracy is very much underpinned by the idea of free will so if uh, a meritocracy underpinned by free will skepticism i suppose would say that people do have some some control they are able to aspire towards something so you can aspire to be a gifted artist you can aspire towards certain things and you know be lucky enough to have the opportunity or have oppor those kind of opportunities to to meet those goals and certainly society can value people who are the best scientist or the best artist and in turn people can aspire to be such a person without obviously the um the assumption that anyone who fails to become this or that is deserving of blame that they didn't you know in, in some way that they are inherently faulty for for not having achieved that. So I think you can have just as um, you know free will skepticism retains some elements and I would say important elements of control and responsibility. In the same way, free will, free will skepticism could retain important elements of the idea of meritocracy and excellence, um, etc. I think that's absolutely true, and there are free will skeptics who who absolutely agree with that. So. I don't think any of that is excluded. I mean, I have my own particular views on certain aspects of, of that in terms of like deterrence and, and others. But there's a philosopher, uh, Benjamin Vilhauer, who actually says, well, praise is easier to justify than blame because of the amount of harm that blame does. And so maybe the more positive aspects of meritocracy could be more easily justified than the negative aspects. And so that would be a way to differentiate it. But I also want to just mention that I also think um, there's no uh, prohibition. There's nothing preventing free will skeptics from embracing a rich notion of social justice. So in the, in the other book I have that came out this year called Rejecting Retributivism, I develop what's called the capabilities approach, which fits very nicely with what you were just saying, which is the idea that essentially, um, uh, you know, social justice should be, the goal of social justice should be the development of um, what I call uh, capabilities or functionings, the ability of agents to do and be who they want to be and be capable of what are called opportunity freedoms. Um, and so what I think is, you know, you want to make sure that we are, we give each individual the sufficient level necessary to achieve the uh, sufficient level of, of human well-being in various uh, aspects of our lives, things like health, like safety, security, autonomy, self-determination, uh, respect for individuals. And all of that I think could be retained. And, and by fostering a kind of uh, public health or public policy approach that tries to um, provide individuals with the same level of opportunity um, could uh, uh, contribute to those features that you are absolutely right, we wanna retain. Like that individuals have some control over their lives, like they do have some autonomy. And that um, by giving them the kind of opportunities that would be needed, they could achieve these levels of well-being. 
But I want to also make it clear that this is not just about handing out or distributing goods. So take a case where like one capability or functioning is mobility. You might need mobility so that you can earn a living to, to, to survive, right? You need a job. And to get to that job, you need transportation and mobility. But in certain approaches to justice, um, we might just hand out things like give everyone bicycles. But that won't really work if you're disabled or if you live in a sexist uh, society where women, for example, social norms are they shouldn't ride bicycles. Right. Um, so simply distributing goods isn't going to um, address the underlying social inequality that is preventing that, that capability or that functioning from being um, uh, achieved in those individuals. So to, to, to lay a level this playing field, it's not just about distributing goods equally. It's about addressing the social inequalities, in this case, the underlying sexism, um, yeah. that, might, that might be the prohibition, the, the thing that's preventing um, a diminishment in well-being. Mm -hmm. And so what I would argue is that free will skeptics can adopt this kind of approach toward identifying the, um, uh, the, the factors that, that are um, limiting individuals, their inequalities, also the social determinants of crime, the kinds of things that drive criminal behavior, the kinds of dr things that drive economic inequality. You could identify those social determinants, those factors of society, um, then you prioritize them, and then you adopt policies that work, best practices that um, address the underlying social injustices. Because often crime is a byproduct of poverty and inequality and racism and sexism and economic inequality or access to healthcare or nutrition. If you address the underlying causes, providing people with the opportunities to achieve, then the um, level of criminal behavior actually drops dramatically. And so it's a much more effective approach. I think it's a much more humane approach. I think it's a much more justified approach given my free will skepticism. But even if, again, you don't share my free will skepticism, you may just think this is a way better approach to addressing social pro problems than to always try to address it on the tail end by placing it on individual responsibility. I do also think that this, you know, conversation moves us a lot closer. I think that's probably all we have time for um, to discuss. But what I think is um, what this conversation or this debate really does is, you know, a lot of the global, and it's not just where it's playing out in the United States, I think it's reflected in other countries as well, where some of these big policy debates where they seem almost intractable, and it's not clear why there is such a huge gulf, um, you know, on, on public policy issues. But I think it's because we are talking on the policy level, but there's a deeper, almost philosophical, um, as I'm discovering, rift between the two sides, because so much of current public policy is focused on the individual, on uh, grounded on these ideas of, of, of free will and thus being able to hold resp individuals responsible in the way that we do. And I think there's this growing and other call that says, hang on, um, there's actually big systemic reasons for a lot of these social challenges and problems and we need to pay more attention to that. And the two sides just, I feel, are not hearing or meeting each other. But I think yeah. we don't meet each other by starting at the policy level. There's an important philosophical discussion that underpins these rifts that needs to be had first. And I think this is kind of the, the missing um, you know, piece of the puzzle. Um, so hopefully this debate does become a bit more of a mainstream topic because I see it as so, you know, so intrinsically or so importantly rather linked to the conversations um, that are absorbing and the, the world is focused on right now. Perfectly said, I agree 100%, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks so much for, for, for making time to talk Thank about. you.